Hey, this is Dr. C. I hope you're having a good day. We're going to talk today, it's kind of a corollary to a talk I gave before on sleep. Now, that is very important, especially to seniors, but it is for anybody. And when you look at the products that are being sold out there to promote sleep, interestingly, half of the damn products that are on the shelves and all, don't contain what it says on the label. Can you believe that? Well, living in this country, you probably can because there's nobody checking it out. So they believe what the pharmaceutical houses tell them. And unless some people report abuses or side of major side effects and all, especially if it kills somebody, uh, well, then they report it. Uh, it's a sad state of events. So we're going to talk about the treatment of sleep. Now, I'm not going to talk as much about, uh, say, uh, behavioral therapy, which is one of the treatments. I'm not going to talk so much about the environment and all like we did before, proper temperature, dark room, all that sort of. Not about that. This is all pharmaceutical stuff that people are spending billions of dollars on to promote sleep. Okay, what are we going to start with? Well, I need to read, uh, refresh your memory, basically, on how we fall asleep. And it is a very complex process. It involves a lot of the ganglia, which is little concentrations of neurons in the brain. It involves neural pathways, these little neurons that interconnect. It involves the neurotransmitters, the substance that each one of those neurons pushes out, hits a receptor, goes to the next neuron, goes to different portions of the brain. All these things are important. And so, uh, without, again, going into a lot of the stuff that may not mean that much to you. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, too, for a very brief, is a polysomnogram, because a lot of these uh, promotional uh, things that are put out for some of these products and all use some of the terminology that's in the polysomnogram. That basically defines the different stages of sleep. So, for example, uh, the initial phase of sleep, which is very uh, short, it's called a transient uh, phase. That's a very short phase. That's before you fall asleep. And then there's the, the, uh, the next phase, which is the early phase of sleep. It's not the deep sleep. It's superficial sleep, but still... That's a major part of our sleep cycle. So probably about half of the damn time you spend asleep, it's in that short stage. And then you go into the deep sleep, the deep sleep. That's where they call these different waves, the delta waves, which are the slow sleep waves and all. Again, I'm not going to bother you with all that nonsense. but uh, And it's not nonsense, I suppose, but that's the third stage of sleep. And then you pass into the very deep stage. Then you pass into the rapid eye movement, REM, rapid eye movement stage. That's the stage where you're in deep sleep. You're paralyzed, basically. The eyes are moving. You don't realize they're moving. Rapid eye movement, remember? That's also the phase where you dream. And you also have nightmares, too. Uh, that can happen. You can get night terrors, not just nightmares, night terrors as well. Um, it's also a phase where you go sleepwalking, too. You sleepwalk. As soon as they hit that slow, deep sleep phase, you can actually start sleepwalking, sleep talking, sleep sex, believe it or not. All these different things that happen that you don't have any idea about. That can happen during these different phases. And a lot of the drugs will be targeting or have an effect on different 
phases of your sleep cycle and all. So again, to remind you of that as a background, let's go into the different medications that are out there that we use. The first one that we use, probably the most common, well, not, maybe now not the most common, but diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Benadryl. It's always on uh, the list of all of the things that are in a lot of these uh, supplements that are used for, for sleep. Benadryl may be one of them. And so for many years, that was the only thing that was available, unless you went out and used things like chloral hydrate. <laughs> chloral hydrate now is used as a date, date rape drug. drug. Uh, but I don't think so, not, not nowadays. In my day, it was, uh, but uh, nevertheless, Benadryl. Positive things, it's an antihistamine. And so, gee, it, it should be, shouldn't bother you, shouldn't hurt you. Well, not necessarily so. The uh, American uh, Geriatric Association does not recommend the use of Benadryl on anything long-term. Now, what do I mean by long-term? Two weeks or longer. Two weeks or longer using Benadryl. Also, the American Academy of Sleep does not recommend Benadryl either, especially in seniors, especially in seniors over 65. And so, why? How come? What's going on? Well, there are a number of different effects that Benadryl has, side effects. Number one, makes you drowsy. Well, I guess that should be good. But seniors have to get up to pee at night. They may be drowsy. Increasing the number of falls and injuries that occur. And so, you can't disregard that. The number of falls that may be a result of the use of Benadryl. Also, Benadryl uh, has an anticholinergic effect. Now, what that means is that acetylcholine has an effect, for example, on bladder. It has an effect all over the body. It's a neurotransmitter, basically. And so, there is a, an anti uh, uh, cholinergic effect on there. So it does have multiple side effects in that regard as well. It also has others. It does lead to confusion in some of the seniors. It does have uh, also uh, an effect on your eye pressure. If you have a relatively high eye pressure, Right on that borderline, it can kick it off into glaucoma. And so, you can also have a urinary retention. Chronic use of Benadryl has been shown to increase the dementia in elderly people. Now, that, that's a fairly substantial number of definite problems with the use of Benadryl. Normally, you use about 50 milligrams half hour before bedtime. But it'll last in the body for at least eight hours, sometimes longer, because in the elderly, metabolism is slower. It may last 10, 12 hours. That's why you may get drowsy. You may wake up, not feel 100%. That's probably the Benadryl. Okay, so it's not recommended by the two major societies. What's the second one? The second one is melatonin. Melatonin. Now that is used all the time now. Melatonin comes from a little gland up in the midbrain called the pineal gland. So when light comes in, hits the first nucleus, that nucleus then sends a transmitter over to different areas of the brain, sends a little transmitter over to the pineal gland to secrete melatonin. So melatonin is secreted at night normally, and it goes down 
in the uh, quantity during the day. So it is light and temperature sensitive that way. Okay, so that is a normal substance. We use it mostly for people who have jet lag. We also use it for people who have shift work. They may have to work different shifts, so they have to sleep different times of the day. Seems to be a little more effective in people like that. It does have many, many more effects, however, than just promoting sleep. What are some of the benefits? Well, some of the benefits would be uh, it syncs. It brings you uh, and syncs the time that you are going to be awake and the time that you're going to be asleep. So that's a good benefit. It supports eye health as well. People who have macular degeneration notice a little benefit when they're using a, slow, a small dose of melatonin daily, probably because of a, a slight anti-inflammatory effect as well. It de decreases reflux, GERD. Now, not the only treatment for it, but people who use melatonin may get some improvement in their GERD symptoms by using it. It also reduces the number of migraines that people can get. And there are some people who get a lot of migraine headaches, and it seems to help. It also seems to help people who are ADHD or uh, hyperactivity, and maybe, maybe a little with autistic people as well. So those are the potential benefits. But what about the side effects? The other side of the coin, a lot of people get nausea with it. People may get headaches with it. People may get more nightmares with it. Why? Because it increases that rapid eye movement time that you have in your sleep cycle. And that's the time you get the nightmares and the dreams. So increasing that time increases the potential for nightmares. You may wake up fatigued. No reason for it. You may also get a decrease in your body temperature from it as well. People who have chronic depressive disorders or anxiety disorders may see a little worsening as a result of using melatonin. So what do those two societies say about melatonin? They don't. They don't recommend it, but on the other hand, they don't say, like with Benadryl, no, 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 you can't use it. So they're on the, on the fence with that. Certainly you should just use a certain dose, one to three milligrams. And I've seen on the stores five milligram tablets, 10 milligram tablets, what happens when you increase the dose to much more than what you need? You might get the opposite effect, believe it or not. If you're going to use melatonin, take it a half hour before sleep and make sure that you don't take too large a dose. Okay, so that is melatonin. Oh, I should mention too, a lot of the things like using these supplements like melatonin they do interact with some other medications. You always have to look at all of the interactions with other medicines. Don't rely on the label, it doesn't tell you squat. Don't rely on your primary doctor, they don't even know a lot of the interactions. Ask your pharmacist, <clears throat> they know. And if they don't know, they know where to look it up and give you the correct answer. So. You need to really be aware of that if you're going to use melatonin. Okay, that's number two, Benadryl, melatonin. GABA, gamma amir, <coughs> I'm sorry, gamma aminobutyric acid, GAB, GABA, GABA, G-A-B-A, and you see that in the stores. You can get GABA. 
Now, interestingly, GABA comes, uh, it's made, it's a neurotransmitter substance, and it is uh, made in the, in the neurons, in the brain as well. It's made from uh, uh, glutamate. Now, glutamate is one of the neurotransmitters that is excitatory. It's called an arousal type of uh, uh, neurotransmitter. Keeps you awake, keeps you active. How come from that you can get GABA, which is just the opposite, it inhibits. So you got that balance. The more GABA you have, the more sedated you may be, it helps to sleep. You don't have much GABA, bang. You get the predominant glutamate and keeps you awake, keeps you awake. So those are going on all the time in the brain. Does it help? What are, what are those two uh, uh, big bodies of uh, intelligentsia? What do they say about it? Again, noncommittal. Noncommittal whether you should use GABA or not. Personally, uh, I have my doubts. I don't use it. The next one, orexin. Now, orexin originally, uh, these are what they are called neuropeptides. In other words, amino acids in the brain, neuropeptides. And they were originally uh, related to appetite. So, uh, and there were two groups, orexin A, orexin B. You know, we don't want to go into a lot of that detail, but nevertheless, they were used to stimulate appetite. And so... They notice that people who have a lot more orexin um, were sleeping better. Wow, okay, that's great, that's great. So now they're looking more into orexin and looking into what they call inhibitory, in other words, anti-orexin drugs to promote sleep, to promote sleep. So. Um, with that in mind, uh, I have the names of them, if you wanted to know the names. Uh, Orexin's a weird name anyway, you may say, but it's, uh, it's the Greek name for uh, appetite, which remember that originally this was looking at appetite and uh, our ability to eat. But that neuropeptide is made in the uh, thalamus of the brain, uh, and people who have uh, a decrease in the amount of uh, orexin, suffer from a disease called uh, narcoplexy. In other words, you're falling asleep. Sort of like having sleep apnea during the day. I could be sitting here and then nodding off. That, that's why I wore my Bernie shirt. He's nodding off uh, at the, uh, the, uh, the president's inauguration. I would have nodded off too. It's ridiculous. But nevertheless, good old Bernie. That's why I wore my shirt. So uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about the orexin and should you use it or not? What do the two societies say? They're on the fence with that. Uh, some of the products that you can buy <coughs> over the counter again do give you uh, some of these anti-orexin, uh, in other words, trying to promote a little bit of that narcolepsy and, and uh, keep it contained, in other words, you want to have a little bit of the uh, orexin around. So, okay. But nevertheless, there are orexin drugs out there, anti-orexin drugs. What's another one? Cannabis. Cannabis now is a big deal, right? Cannabis, my gosh. Um, I personally uh, do take CBD at night more for back pain and for pain and anxiety. No question that the CBD does allay a lot of the anxiety. And that's probably what works. It relaxes you. Not to the point where you give a crap about anything, you know, but nevertheless, it does relax you and you do tend to sleep a little bit better. You may go to sleep a little faster, stay asleep a little longer, and 
most likely will not wake up with a big hangover or drowsy, that type of thing. Okay. One caveat, however, two caveats. Number one, it's dosage related. If you're going to use CBD for sleep, it's dosage related. So you start maybe with 10 milligrams. A lot of people use the gummies because it's very predictable in the dose that you get. So you, stay, you start with one gummy, 10 milligrams. No effect. Then you take two, 20 milligrams. Now at 20 milligrams, I get a dry mouth. In other words, I get some of the side effects, not bad side effects, but dry mouth, dry eyes, that type of thing. So I know that there's CBD in that gummy. I need about 30 milligrams personally to help me to sleep better and to alleviate some of the pain. Okay, some people may need more. It's perfectly safe. I've seen people who needed 50 milligrams, 60, 100 milligrams. Still safe to use. Now, the, ca the caveat number two besides the dosage is uh, basically um, using the newer forms now of cannabis. Delta-8 and Delta-9 THC. Now, before it was just CBD and, uh, and uh, THC, not anymore. Not anymore. They've identified that THC Delta-9 as the major psychoactive THC. Delta-8 is supposed to be less active. Of course, Cannabis Commission does not know what the hell they're doing. And so it's being sold in, uh, in Massachusetts where uh, you can do recreational use of that. And they still haven't made up their minds whether this is good or bad or whatever. So I would stick just with the CBD for the present time. Don't get sucked into using more and more of the THC. Okay? That is the major thing. Now, there's been drugs that we've used for years. Benzos, benzodiazepine. <clears throat> the mother drug is Valium. But there's loads of different benzos that are out there. And, um, for example, Ativan, which is lorazepam, uh, Xanax, Halcyon, Clonopin, Librium, loads of different benzos that are out there that people use. Our two major societies do not use either, any of them, any of them. Not only the benzos, but also the benz receptor um, uh, drugs, which are called the Z drugs, which are like Ambien, Sonata, uh, that type of thing. Um, Lunesta, all those, do not use on both of those. Why? Number one, high risk of getting addicted. That is number one. And let me tell you, being addicted to benzos is not a good thing. It is not easy to come off of the benzos. Yeah, they do work. They relax you. In fact, we use it sometimes <clears throat> for seizures. We use it for muscle spasm. Yeah, it is a relaxer. But the problem is, is that once people get the effect of it, they like it, they want to use it every day, you go over two weeks using it, you're hooked. In fact, when they looked at people who were using it, roughly 44% of people who have used benzos for longer than two weeks become addicted. 44%. That's not a small number, and it is not easy to come off of them. Okay, so I'm not going to go into it any more than that because, damn it, you shouldn't be using them. Okay.
What's next? We can use antidepressants. Um, one of the common ones, back when I was back in practicing in medicine and all, uh, I was using uh, a lot of the antidepressants for, for sleep. There are a lot of them out there. I, you can use trazodone. Uh, in fact, I think I was probably using uh, trazodone as a, as a primary drug to, uh, for, for sleep. Um, but also, they were using amitriptyline. Uh, so they're using a number of different uh, uh, drugs for that. Um, some of them do help. They do help to put you to sleep. Uh, and the, the two societies, again, recommend short-term, short-term usage for people who can't sleep because of depression or anxiety, or both. So they always have that caveat. When you have the sleep disorder and depression or anxiety, short-term use of the antidepressants are okay. Okay. Anything else? Well, there are a number of uh, different roots, different uh, natural products you can use. Valerian root, for example. Valerian uh, grows usually in Europe or Asia. It doesn't grow in the United States. Well, uh, valerian root, uh, they don't have any uh, comment on that. Uh, whether you want to use it or not, many, uh, it's kind of split with all of the testing that's been done on valerian root, whether it works or not. You want to give it a try, give it a try, but don't be uh, terribly disappointed if it doesn't work. Oh, okay. Those are all the major medications and all that are used to promote sleep. The important thing with sleep, though, remember, is you must relax. It's got to be dark. Turn that damn TV off. Turn your, your little, uh, uh, your, your little uh, uh, phone, not use as a phone anymore, but turn it off, all light off, and temperature. Ideal temperature for sleep, remember, is 68. 68. Okay, this is Dr. C. Have a good night's sleep. <laughs>